Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. In today's program, we're going to be focusing on brook trout. Specifically, we're going to talk about their distribution, impacts on their habitat, stocking programs, the importance of genetics, and of course, how to angle for them. It's going to be a truly fascinating look at a species that has been highly regarded by anglers since the first settlers came to North America. Stay with us, it's going to be a great program. I truly love fly fishing for brook trout has to do with the wonderful environments that they exist in. From the small meandering streams of Maine to mountain rivers in the west, brook trout can only exist in clean and pure environments. Within their native range, brook trout are prized, though a generally small fish, with a long heritage of associated fishing lore. They're extremely sensitive to pollution, habitat degradation, and fishing pressure. Brook trout go by many names or handles, some of the more common include Eastern Brook Trout, Speckled Trout, Native, Spotted Trout, Speckled Char, Brook Char, Salter, Coaster, Square Tail, Brookie, Mud Trout, Aurora Trout, and even Mountain Trout. Brook Trout are native to Eastern Canada and Northeastern United States, and their natural distribution extends as far west as Eastern Minnesota. Their original range also included the Appalachian Mountains, where they're still found in many high elevation streams as far south as Georgia. They're also found as far north as Ngava in northern Quebec. Brook trout are technically not true trout, but are closely related to trout. They are char and members of a family composed of lake trout, bull trout, blueback trout, dolly varden, and arctic char. All these species are members of an ancient order of fish that had their beginnings more than 100 million years ago. As a native North American fish, brook trout have long been a favorite of stream and pond anglers, especially in the northeastern region of North America. The transplanting and stocking of hatchery-reared brook trout has been a subject of controversy both among anglers and members of the scientific community for more than a century. Sylvia D'Amelio recently completed her Master's of Science degree at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. Her thesis applied high-resolution genetic markers to determine if coaster brook trout were a unique stock or a life history variant of typical brook trout. Coasters are large, silver, migratory brook trout which exist only in Lake Superior. Due to a variety of pressures, only a handful of populations exist today. Sylvia loves to fly fish, and I recently had the opportunity to spend part of a day fishing with her and also discussing the work they're doing on brook trout at Trent University. What I found most fascinating was how the study of genetics is helping to spell many myths associated with management of stocking programs throughout North America. Um, stocking has been a major, major management technique, a significant management technique in both Canada and the U.S. for quite a few years now. And it's been used in a variety of situations, including rehabilitation, including uh, put-and-take lakes, so this idea of putting in fish for angling purposes only. Um, there's a variety of applications. Now there's good and bad ways to use these fish, there's good and, and bad applications, and there are consequences for each application. Um, in particular, one of the major questions being raised now is what fish should be used for stocking when you're considering rehabilitating a stream, creek, or, or lake. And this is true for not only brook trout, but for all salmonids and, and for a variety of species, really to maintain the genetic integrity of an area, it's important to look at the most closely related populations for rehabilitation, as opposed to looking to a distant area or to a distant population because we either like the way they look or we like their size or they're easy to get. The problem with using these distant populations is that we begin to homogenize brook trout or whatever species across their range. And as soon as you do that, you start decreasing that evolutionary stability of that species, its potential to survive long term. With the new advances in molecular techniques, namely with the invention of the polymerase chain reaction, which essentially just allows the copying of DNA, making millions of copies of a single fragment of DNA, 
we now have the ability to use very small amounts of tissue or scales or slime, even fish slime, to get our DNA from. And what this allows us to do is to work with species or populations that are low in numbers, where you cannot remove fish because these numbers are so low, um, and where you do want to live release these fish and you'd like to see where they go, maybe tag doing some telemetry work on top of the genetic work. So now you can combine techniques as well. And so what you end up with is a system where scientists, biologists, anglers, all of these people can catch and release live fish, collect either a few scales, a little bit of fish slime, uh, tip off the caudal fin, cut off a little bit piece of tissue that will grow back, do the genetics, and yet leave these fish in there for future generations, leave them in there for future study. Though many people know what a brook trout looks like, uh, most people don't know what a coaster brook trout looks like. And coaster brook trout are very unique in that they migrate from streams to Lake Superior to live a chunk of their adult life. And once in the lake, they turn quite silver, and they adopt a different lifestyle. They eat different prey. They do different things. But then in the fall, a good number of them return back into the streams. But upon returning, they put, on, they put back that colorful, that magical brook trout coloration that most anglers just love to see. So they return up these creeks and streams, and they spawn at the same time, and sometimes in the same beds as typical small brook trout. Now, what's made this fishery so unique and so different is that it's the only place that, it's occur that this occurs. We do have salters on the eastern range, but that's into salt water. Within the freshwater system, this is the only place where we have silver brook trout, a migratory form of silver brook trout that gets quite large, up to 24, 26 inches in length. So this world-class fishery has attracted a lot of attention, and in, in many books, you know, back in the 18th century, you see writings of um, people pulling out buckets of large brook trout and, and how fabulous the fishing was. And it was uh, a very fanciful sort of, of thought to go and fish the Nipigon River, the Nipigon area. Since then, um, as, as early as the mid-1800s, they were no starting to notice a decline in coaster brook trout. And unfortunately, that decline continued unmanaged and unchecked to a point where coaster brook trout have virtually been extirpated along their southern range. The U.S. has maybe two populations remaining of coaster brook trout, and one of them is actually a stocked population. Along the North sh Shore, there are still remaining brook trout populations, and it remains their stronghold. And this is the point where now we have to manage these fisheries as special units and as something worth preserving as part of our heritage. The Nipigon River, which is located on the North Shore of Lake Superior, is the home of huge coaster brook trout. The current world record brook trout was caught here in 1916 by Dr. John William Cook. The Nipigon River is also the birthplace of one of the most famous general purpose streamer flies of all time, the mudder minnow. This fly was designed by Don Gapin in the 1930s to imitate sculpin, which are one of the favorite prey of large brook trout. Scott Smith lives near the Nipigon River in Thunder Bay, Ontario. He's a well-respected regional guide, author, and is a fanatical brook trout fisherman. I spent a late August day with him casting dry flies for migratory coasters on some tributaries of the mighty Nipigon River. Brook trout are prolific spawners and will often overpopulate a stream, pond, or lake. When this occurs, fish become stunted. They'll be small and thin, with heads disproportionately large in relation to their body size. Brook trout are opportunistic feeders and will eat whatever they can find. In small streams, they prefer aquatic insects or invertebrates that live under the rocks and along the stream bottom. They are also known to feed heavily on the adult stage of aquatic insects, such as mayflies and caddis, as they hatch and take flight during their brief courtship and egg laying cycle. Terrestrial insects like ants and beetles that fall into the water are readily eaten as are smaller crayfish. When they grow larger, their need for a high protein diet necessitates consumption of small fish such as minnows, sculpin, and darters. They frequently cannibalize on their own young in areas of high forage competition such as in Labrador or Quebec. Brook trout are, in general, more eager to come to the hook than brown trout with whom they cross range and share some common waters. Today, large brook trout are fairly uncommon, except in some of the lake and river systems in Canada, particularly Quebec and Labrador, 
and in some locations where they have access to big water forage, such as in certain Great Lakes tributaries. Brook trout like to hide under overhanging banks, around rocks and boulders, and under logs as protection from shorebirds such as great blue herons, comorants, and kingfishers. They'll also congregate over moss and vegetation on a stream bottom to mask their presence from birds and other predators. Brook trout require clean, clear, cold streams in order to thrive. If they do not have relatively cold, unpolluted water to live in, they will quickly perish. The maximum temperature for brookies is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Brook trout prefer a temperature range of 57 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which helps explain why they are often located in headwaters of major rivers and in the cold tributary feeders of lakes and ponds. Several factors conspire against the widespread success of brook trout populations. Starting in the late 1800s, many populations were lost due to logging techniques, agriculture, and industry pollution. Several of their populations were replaced with other stock species of trout, such as rainbows. I'm sitting here in the rain, looking at a beautiful small little stream flowing through uh, southwestern Ontario. Small streams make up likely about 90% of, uh, of the types of streams in any particular watershed. They're the headwaters, the capillaries, if you will, of the, uh, of the, um, of the main, main watershed. They're extremely sensitive as well. Because they're the capillaries, they're the ones where the greatest amounts of interchange between the environment and the, and the uh, water column occur. They're where, the, where uh, nutrients enter, where sediments enter, and where the water itself enters to create and uh, replenish the uh, overall larger watershed that they flow through and uh, are part of. This particular uh, stream is, uh, relies very much on, the, on groundwater for its, uh, to maintain its flow. Right now we're very fortunate to have a rainfall event which will start to replenish the water table in this area and maintain the flow of these little systems. Small streams, especially in areas that, uh, where there's limited rainfall, dry up very easily. And as a result, they rely on frequent rainfall events to maintain their flows. Small streams also require a lot of other things to maintain themselves. Small streams, more than larger rivers, are controlled by their vegetation and their quality and the density of the rooting of that vegetation along the stream. So that as we as people decide to alter the land use activities within a system and start to clear cut uh, forests, such as these types of forests here, or clear the land for agriculture. If we plow or move and remove material too close to these rivers, we lose the deep, dense root systems that are native to these areas. When that occurs, the stream can no longer contain itself within its banks and the frequent heavy rainfall events start to blow the channel apart. Small streams rely upon this vegetation. As a matter of fact, small streams even smaller than this are ultimately completely controlled by the vegetation. So they, the streams come into dynamic equilibrium, if you will, with the vegetation trying to colonize the channel and the water volumes that are there periodically trying to push that vegetation and the roots back. When that occurs, these streams become extremely stable little entities. They're usually, especially in areas where there's a lot of grass, deep grass, rooted grasses and sedges, they're very narrow, but very deep. And they're very stable. Um, one gentleman was mentioning to me that they've been doing some recent research on a small stream in southwestern Ontario, and archaeological information would suggest that that stream and its channel have been relatively in the same location for 3,000 years. So little streams, then, are very sensitive to land use activities. If we change land use activities radically, we change the amount of sediment that comes into the channel, we change the quality of the rooting, which can affect changes on the banks and their stability, that rooting also will change the width and depth ratio of the stream. Most little streams are very narrow and deep. They flow through, say, scrub bush and um, densely gra grass or sedge vegetation. When we remove that material, for example, for grazing, the channel will widen and shallow and lose the quality of habitat important for the small fish, such as the brook trout, that live in those systems. As well, when we clear the land adjacent to them, these little streams are very uh, sensitive to solar radiation. When they, we start to open them up, they will rapidly increase in temperature. And again, if it's a cold water stream, we will lose that system very quickly. Thankfully, both government, wildlife and fishery management departments, national volunteer organizations, and community volunteer groups are making a difference for brook trout. 
Some of their efforts include recognizing the importance of preserving native brook trout populations, enhancing protective habitat, collecting species-specific data on native populations in order to make better management decisions, and most importantly, helping to restore the water quality needed to sustain these wonderful fish. Recently, I had the opportunity to fly fish on the renowned Sable River in upstate New York with Robert Streeter. Robert is a respected author and an aquatic biologist with the New York State Department of Environment and Conservation. Near a small feeder creek on the Sable, we found some nice brook trout that were willing to take our dry flies off the top. The key distinguishing markings of brook trout are spots along the back which are elongated and appear worm-like, while the spots below the lateral line are round, red, and each is surrounded by a bluish halo. The fins along the bottom of brook trout are highly distinctive and quite striking. They have a white leading edge followed by a black streak, with the rest of the fin displaying various shades of red, orange, and yellow. Sea run brook trout and coasters have more subdued coloration. Most people agree that brook trout are probably one of the prettiest freshwater fish in North America. One of my favorite places to fly fish for brook trout is on small streams. Small streams are special because they provide an intimacy with nature that is hard to replicate in any other environment. Each stream is unique in its own way, and the abundant wildlife and fauna make the fishing almost secondary to the overall pleasures you discover. Last summer, I spent a wonderful day fishing with a friend, Raymond Sandor Regier, on a small stream near Elmer, Quebec. The brook trout were absolutely exquisite, as was the surrounding idyllic countryside. In some areas, brook trout are held in the highest esteem by anglers, naturalists, and the scientific community. Wild brook trout are natives to Pennsylvania and have the distinct honor of being named the state fish. Last spring, I joined two friends to fly fish for brookies on Black Moshannon Creek on the Allegheny Plateau in Pennsylvania. This creek is fed by clear springs which flow through a series of highland bogs. The water that flows through the sphagnum moss and other wetland plants tints the flow with plant tannins. Thus, in a sense, the bog vegetation acts like a giant tea bag to color the water. The state manages this stream and others in the area with a well-coordinated stocking program. On the day we were angling for brookies, it was cold and damp. The creek was running high and there was no surface activity. By using heavy and well-sized nymphs combined with strike indicators, both John and Jan got multiple hookups with brook trout. Brookies are considered relative pushovers in comparison to other species such as rainbows or brown trout. As such, they are very susceptible to overfishing and harvest. Anglers of all disciplines must practice stringent catch and release in order to preserve healthy resonant stocks of brookies. Brook trout are a native fish in North America and they are a special fish to many anglers because of their color, because of the waters they inhabit, these cold, clean, cool lakes and creeks which are considered a you know, very prized spot to visit. Given this and given the amount of habitat here in Ontario and the amount of, of wild lands still left, there is still a good deal of, or a good number of wild populations in existence. And 
seeing what has happened to the southern populations, be it in southern Ontario or in the United States, there's been a change in management practices. So in particular, for example, on the north shore of Lake Superior, there's been a change in the size limit of brook trout. Um, now with the Minipigan River, it's only possible to keep a single fish over 20 inches. Now in addition to that, there's also a change in the way people look at fish, in the way anglers look at fish. There's, so there's an increase in catch and release, there's an increase in use of barbless hooks, all of which increase the survivability of fish once caught and released. Now given this and different management practices, it is possible that we will see a comeback to threaten brook trout populations and a stability in, in current, current brook trout populations. And coaster brook trout, in fact, on the north shore of Superior have seen a stabilization in their numbers and hopefully we'll see a comeback. So changing management practices in the way we view fish and the way we handle fish can actually have a significant impact on their survival. One of the last places left in North America to catch a trophy-sized brook trout is Labrador. This past summer, I had the distinct pleasure of fishing at Eagle Lake Lodge, which is located on the renowned Eagle River watershed. In this region, there's minimal impacts from man, and thankfully, the management at the lodge, like most in the province, believes in strict catch and release for all trout. The net result is that anglers can expect to catch numerous brook trout in the three to five pound size and even possibly hook a trophy of up to eight pounds. On this particular day in late August, I joined some people who were visiting from Maine to fish a series of ripples on the river. I'm Tom Rosenbauer. For videos like the one you just saw and more, subscribe to our channel. You don't want to miss our weekly uploads of educational videos, exciting trips, and much more.